very cool. Thank you guys for being here. I'm pumped for today. Uh, I'm not going to lie, I wasn't like super excited before worship, but man, David and the man they just did a fantastic job. Can we get a hand to the band guys for doing like an incredible job? Thank you guys. That was awesome. So my name is Casey Peoples. I am the student pastor over at First Baptist Church, and I'm really pumped to get to be with you guys today. Uh, I love speaking, and, um, and I, this was very last minute, actually. So it was Monday that I met Mark, and we were talking, and uh, I said, hey, man, you know, if you ever need anybody uh, at Chapel at USW, like, I'm, I'm there. And he's like, okay, uh, this Wednesday. <laughs> I was like, sweet, let's do it. So I'm really pumped to be here. Uh, a few things to know about me. I am 23 years old. I am married to uh, my beautiful wife, Caitlin, and this is a picture of us, uh, and this is our dog as well. Do we have, do we have that picture? Oh, no. Okay, now we don't have a picture, but it's okay. Just trust that my wife is beautiful. Hmm? Who's your wife? Caitlin. What's your wife? Caitlin Peoples. Oh, I love her. I do, too. <laughs> I do, too. Yeah, she's pretty great, isn't she? She's really great. I love her. Yeah, she's pretty cool. Thank you. Thank you. She didn't do so bad herself, but, you know. Uh, right, so, no, so I'm married, and I have an amazing dog. Her name's Annie. She's a husky mix. Uh, you might think that you have a good dog. Maybe some of you are missing your dog back home. Uh, the only reason you think you have a good dog is because you haven't met my dog. Uh, she's essentially perfect. She's absolutely amazing. So, I love Jesus. I love getting to talk about him. And I love talking about his kingdom. And that's what I'm going to be talking about today is the kingdom of God. I have a video to show you guys uh, by a group of people who do a much better job explaining these biblical truths than I do. Check this out. beautiful poem. It's in the book of Isaiah. The city of Jerusalem has just been destroyed by Babylon, a great kingdom in the north. And all of these Jewish people, they've been sent away into exile, but a few remain in the city. And they're left wondering, what just happened? Has our God abandoned us? Right, because Jerusalem was supposed to be the city where God would reign over the world to bring peace and blessing to everyone. Now, Isaiah had been saying that Jerusalem's destruction was a mess of Israel's own making. They had turned away from their God, become corrupt, and so their city and their temple were destroyed. Yeah, everything seems lost. But the poem goes on. There's a watchman on the city walls. And far out on the hills, we see a messenger, and he's running towards the city. He's running and he's shouting, good news. And Isaiah says, how beautiful on the mountains are the feet of those who bring Good news. Beautiful feet? Yes. The feet are beautiful because they're carrying a beautiful message. What's the message? That despite Jerusalem's destruction, Israel's God still reigns as king, and that God himself is going to one day return to this city, take up his throne, and bring peace. And the watchmen sing for joy because of the good news that their God still reigns. Now in the New Testament, we find this same phrase, the good news. It's the Greek word euangelion, and it's also sometimes translated with the word gospel. And so when Christians say, do you believe the gospel, they mean, do you believe the news? But not just any news. In the Bible, this phrase is always about the announcement of the reign of a new king. And in the New Testament, the gospels use this phrase to summarize all of Jesus' teachings. They say that he went about proclaiming the good news of God's kingdom. So Jesus saw himself as the messenger, bringing the news that God reigns. Yes, but the way that he described God's reign, it surprised everybody. I mean, think, a powerful, successful kingdom that needs to be strong, able to impose its will, able to defeat its enemies. But Jesus said the greatest person in God's kingdom was the weakest, the one who loves and who serves the poor. And he said that you live under God's reign when you respond to evil by loving your enemies and forgiving them and seeking peace. This is an upside down kingdom. Now Jesus also said that this kingdom was arriving with him. Yeah, so for example, there's this really interesting story where there's a high ranking Roman officer and he comes to Jesus begging him to heal his servant. And he even calls Jesus his Lord, acknowledging that Jesus is his authority. Jesus praises this man for recognizing what no one else yet had, that not only was Jesus announcing God's kingdom, he was the king. And so the word gets out that this Jewish man from Galilee is talking and acting like he's the king of Israel. 
He's appointing 12 disciples, which are an image of Israel's 12 tribes. He's healing people, forgiving people their sins. And all of this so threatened Israel's leaders that they finally decide to have him killed. And Jesus let them. Yeah, which is a weird thing to do if you're trying to become king. That's right. But for Jesus, this is what had to happen. Jesus saw the sin and the devastation of his people Israel as just one small part of the entire human condition. How all humanity has rebelled against God, resulting in the tragedy and devastation of our whole world. And so how is God going to bring his reign over such a world? Jesus believed it would be through an act of sacrificial love for his enemies. This is why in the Gospels, Jesus' crucifixion is depicted as his enthronement as the king of the Jews. Yeah, he receives a crown. He also receives a robe. He's exalted up, not onto the throne, but onto the cross. How beautiful are the feet that bring good news. And the good news now is that Jesus has defeated death and that he reigns as king that he's dealt with our sin and corruption himself, and that he's conquered it with his life and with his love. And then Jesus sends his followers to go out and keep announcing this good news of the upside down kingdom. And to invite everyone to give their allegiance to him, the king who defeated death with his love. So I personally was never excited about the kingdom of God until I started to understand who God was and what his kingdom was like. In the first few pages of Genesis, the very first book in scripture, the the Bible introduces this divine being, this new character that comes onto the scene, and this character is the creator of everything. And in verse two, it describes the world as it is before God is interacting with it. And you get words like void or darkness or abyss, some of your translations might say, and it says that that the world was covered in waters. And if you dive into the original Hebrew words that are of the words of waste and void and waters, uh, those words are uh, tohu bohu and my. I'm sure that's exactly what you thought about this morning when you woke up. What are the Hebrew words uh, for waste and water? These words have a very interesting connection and theme amongst them, and that is uh, violence, danger, and chaos. And then God introduces creation. This divine being makes something, and he makes life. And that's the rest of chapter 1 and 2. Is this God, this divine creature, seeing and creating and giving? He's essentially, he's like almost moving the chaos out and bringing life in. And God creates humanity. And humanity, in response to this God, reintroduces chaos. They reintroduce violence. And in Genesis 6, Uh, It tells the tale of humanity's corruption and how over all the earth at this point in time, human beings were incredibly wicked and broken and violent. And so this divine being responds to humans' chaos with water, with floodwaters, a symbol of almost it returning to its chaotic state before God introduced creation and life because this is what humanity has brought back in to God's world. So very early on in the pages of scripture, we see there's two very distinct paths. There's a path that declares this divine being as king and living under his rule and authority and receiving the things that he presents, life, peace, and joy, creation, or we can choose to dethrone this divine being and the results of dethroning this divine being in our lives is violence and chaos and fear and anger. Deuteronomy chapter 30 verse 19 there's this uh, character introduced in the narrative named Moses. Uh, Moses was a follower of this God 
Um, we find out in the narrative that this divine being name is Yahweh, which means the one who is. And so a follower of Yahweh, a man named Moses, he is speaking to a very, very large crowd of supposed to be God's chosen family, a nation that he's made a promise to say, look, I'm going to enter into the narrative of humanity through you as a nation. And so Moses is standing in front of uh, all of the Israelites at this time, and he's explaining to them what it means to follow Yahweh and be obedient to him. This is Deuteronomy 30, verse 19. He says, I call heaven and earth to witness against you today. I place before you life and death, blessing and curse. So choose life, that your children will live and love Yahweh your God, listening obediently to him, firmly embracing him. Oh yes, he is life itself. So the pages of scripture, they introduce this divine being as a being of life. And apart from him, we are to receive death. And then, a new character comes onto the scene in the narrative of Scripture in the New Testament. And this character, he is very much so like the previous patriarchs of Moses and Noah and Abraham, these followers of Yahweh. But there's something very, very different about this new prophet. He's not only a follower of Yahweh, but the line between human and divine is very blurred with this new character. And we don't really, it, it's hard to see the difference in the scriptures versus his humanity and his divine attributes. And so Jesus is this character. And in Luke chapter 10, he is attempting to advance Yahweh's rule. Yahweh's kingdom. And this is what it says in Luke chapter 10. We're going to do verses 1 through 9. After this, Jesus appointed 70 other people, and he sent them to go ahead of him two by two into every town and place where he was about to go. And he said to them, The harvest is plentiful, plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, I want you to pray earnestly to the Lord of harvest to send out laborers into the harvest. Go your way. Behold, I am sending you out as lambs amongst wolves. Carry no money bag or knapsack, no sandals, and I want you to greet anybody on the road. Whatever house you enter, I want you to say, peace be to this house. And if a son of peace is there, your peace will rest on him. But if not, they will return to you and remain in the same house, eating and drinking, that's my favorite part, what they provide. For the laborer deserves his wages. Do not go from house to house. Whenever you enter a town and they receive you, eat what is set before you. And my favorite verse, heal the sick. And say to them, the kingdom of God has come near to you. So Jesus is trying to advance this new way of being human, this way of peace, and this way of healing. Humanity has been dethroning Yahweh for a very, very long time. And Jesus is trying to get these people to re-elect Yahweh in their own lives. And so now we have two choices to either ascribe to our own way or to ascribe to this divine being's way, Yahweh's way, Jesus' way. And maybe you're trying to figure out who this God character is. Maybe you still have a lot of questions and before you want to give your allegiance to this guy who lived 2,000 years ago and was a self-proclaimed teacher. Um, and if you still have questions or you want to have a conversation about Jesus, I'm absolutely available, and I'd love to have a conversation with you after this, because um, I don't think, um, I believe it's possible, but it's not likely that your life is just going to super change right now here in this moment, just because some 23-year-old ginger kid is sitting on stage trying to tell you about this character of Jesus. I believe it happens through relationships, because uh, that's what Jesus did. So if you want to have a conversation about him, I'd love to, I'd love to talk about him. Um, Maybe some of you here are experiencing intense fits of anxiety or fear, and you don't really know why. Um, maybe some of you are dealing with anger um, or frustration with the world, and, uh, and you don't know what to do about it. You don't know how to fix it. Don't know if you've noticed, but our country is obviously in a really tough place right now. And um, I don't really pick any sides. I just think everyone's kind of dumb right now, and we all need Jesus. 
Um, humanity has dethroned God. And the results, if you haven't noticed, are chaos and death. And we've seen that in the shootings, the suicide rates. That is the result of dethroning this divine creator, is chaos and death. We are almost symbolically being washed with water again because of our own choices. But through Jesus and through Yahweh, we can find life. But you have to search and you have to ask. And I'm someone you can ask. <laughs> so wherever you are with this story of Jesus and trying to understand him, uh, I want you to know that from my personal experience, Jesus is life. He's absolutely changed me. He's changed the way that I've seen him. Um, I used to think that I could define what was right. I could decide what was good. And by doing so, I made myself king over my life. And I found no peace through that. And I found no joy through that. And it wasn't until I dethroned myself and said, Jesus, I want you to be king over my life. That was when I started to experience peace. That's when I started to experience joy and real love. Um, and it saved my marriage. Um, my marriage would have absolutely ended. I don't just mean that and I couldn't have gone through without Jesus. No, I actually mean um, if, if there, we had a, a catastrophic thing happen to our marriage and if I didn't have Christ and she didn't have Christ, we absolutely would be divorced right now and uh, I'd be a lot more sad on this stage. So the kingdom of God is wherever God is king. So if you made him king in your life, you're walking in the kingdom of God. If you've dethroned God in your life, you've dethroned Yahweh, then you are not walking in the kingdom of God and Jesus is not your king. And that would explain uh, any kinds of fears and angers and frustrations that might be in your heart. So I'd love to have a conversation about that. Um, I love you guys, I care about you. I know I don't even know you and you don't even know me, but it's because, of, uh, because I'm in this kingdom I'm enabled to, to love people that I don't know. And I really hope and pray that you guys get to know Jesus as this king and discover him and his love and his peace. I'm going to pray.